Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. All right, we are uh, in uh, the life and teachings of Paul, session number, oh, about, 90, about 99 or 96, 90 or something. I don't know. We started in January of 2014, and uh, on Wednesday nights, we, we're still going, but we're close because this is, uh, we're in the last two letters that Paul wrote, and so we're going to finish those by the first of the year, in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, well, then we'll go on to something else from there. Praise God. We are, we, last week we started on 1 Timothy chapter 4. Got to about the third verse and got hung up and never, first, oh, third, third, fourth verse uh, down in there. And we never really got past that. So um, <clears throat> Paul starts out. We'll just reread those verses. We're not going to recover them, but we're going to reread them. So um, verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. That in the latter times, now in this particular case, it does not mean the last days. In other words, it's not right before Jesus comes, the latter times. Technically in the Greek, a time after uh, the writing of this letter. So it could have been the next week. All right? It'd be like me saying, guys, let me tell you something. There's stuff on the horizon. There's some stuff about to happen. So that would be the latter days after this statement. All right? So that's what Paul said here. Then he goes on and he says, um, uh, so some shall depart from the faith giving heed um, to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now remember that we said last week that what happens when people depart from the faith, they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines. All of a sudden, they'll, they'll come up with some of the craziest, looniest stuff and believe it. A number of years ago, we had a, we had a person uh, in, our, in our church came to me. They had gone to some conference somewhere, came back, and they started talking about, you know, that the mustard seed produces branches, and the branches had the birds come and lodge in it, and those birds are demon spirits. And then their big revelation for that conference was the Holy Spirit wasn't a person. There's only two people in the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son. The Holy Spirit's in it. He's just a force. And, uh, you know, I'm like, really? So anyway, we had to have a discussion. He didn't listen. I had to deal with it, and he left. Hallelujah. Why? Because he wouldn't listen. So you give heed to seducing spirits. They will seduce you by the mental soundness, it seems, of their arguments. And they're, they're, listen, faith is not of the head, it's of the heart. The Word of God is revealed to us by the Holy Ghost. It's a spiritual force. It will make sense. It will, it will uh, transform your mind, but you cannot sit around and use your mind to try to figure it out. It has to be revealed by the Holy Ghost, the teacher. Amen. And so seducing spirits, and then what, and what did seducing spirits bring? Doctrines of devils. Everybody say, devils? All right, anyway. Hallelujah. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. Just because somebody shows them and says, the Lord sent me, it could be the Lord of the flies, Beelzebub. Doesn't mean it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you here? Jesus said, man, he'll come in my name. And he'll say, he'll tell them, I, I never knew you. Well, they, they, they got a business card that says, Apostle, Prophet of, of the third dimension uh, of the higher tabernacle, whatever, so-and-so. You've, yeah, you've seen some of the titles. I mean, people can, I mean, they can come up with all kinds of titles and make them sound authentic. Let me tell you something. If you ain't got the goods, it don't matter what you put on your card. Hello. It's like going into, I mean, have you ever gone into a restaurant and pick up the, the table placard? And that, I'm telling you that whatever picture of food, dessert, whatever it is on there looks so good. I mean, your, your, your tongue is just, just, oh, man, just licking the table, just slobbering all over the place. It looks so good. And then they bring it out. You take a bite of it. You think, my God, that's horrible. Are you kidding me? This is nasty. Now, I've gotten old. I get, I don't, I look, this is terrible. And you're charging 15 I ain't, I ain't. <laughs> I ain't paying that kind of money for that dog food. You know, you made it look good. You made it sound good. It's nasty. Well, you know, hello. So just because it looks like one thing doesn't mean it's right. They'll speak lies. And listen, there's a lot of people out there who are seducing the body of Christ because they say I'm calling. We can't judge anybody. You better judge some things. Are you here? You better discern, you better discern some things. And listen, having their conscience seared or cauterized, as the Greek, with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from each. Isn't it interesting that uh, the things that God tells us to do, 
People who are outside of God tell us not to do. Forbidding to marry. Well, God told us very, the very first ordinance for the, for the humanity was be fruitful and multiply. A man should leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife. They're to be fruitful and multiply. You're supposed to get married. You, you, know, you ain't supposed to get married. We don't believe in marriage. It's, we're beyond that. We're, you know, it's a free love society. Yeah, it's a free devil society. You know? And abstaining from meats, well, God, the Bible says for every creature, um, I'm sorry, for, abstaining from each which God created to be received with thanksgiving. Of them which believe and know the truth, for every creature of God is good, nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving, for it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Now, we move on. This, this, so that's as far as we got last week. It is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. You pray over it, it's sanctified. You can't eat that. That's pork. That's, that's forbidden. Did you not remember that Jesus appeared to Peter and had a, had a sheep come down out of heaven? And the Lord spoke to Peter and said, rise, uh, Peter, kill, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, not so, Lord, nothing unclean has ever touched my lips. He said, what the Lord has cleansed, thou shalt not call unclean. Now, I know there's a double meaning there because part one, the, the, the allegory was that the Gentiles were now to be received into the kingdom of God. But he also was telling them it's all right to eat the meat. It's all right to eat these different things. You can have some shrimp. You can have some pork. We had some on Sunday. Hallelujah. I mean, did anybody enjoy eating that unclean animal? Hallelujah. It was received with thanksgiving and prayer. Hallelujah. Can you shout amen? I said, Lord, thank you that we could eat the pig. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm done. Every time I cook my barbecue, I'm down there, and I'm hand chopping, and of course, I'm partaking while I chop. Just making sure it's... Yeah, that's right. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I receive it with thanksgiving. Woo! Thank you, Lord. And prayer. Hallelujah. Glory. I'm glad he cleansed the pork. Now, some of the dietary laws were some of the, a lot of animals, animals are scavengers. You know, shrimp is a scavenger. Did y'all know that? How many like catfish? They're scavengers. They're bottom dwellers. Did y'all know that? They're bottom dwellers. They eat the stuff on the bottom. That's why when you get farm-raised catfish, it's better because they, they grain them, they keep the ponds cleared out, and so they're, they're not eating all this junk on the bottom. Hallelujah. In my hometown of Aiden, North Carolina, population 5,372, salute. Hallelujah. They have a catfish for me. My, one of my family members was up in Maryland one time and sent back, I'm in Maryland, and they got on the menu, Aiden, uh, Aiden farm-raised catfish. It was, a, it was supposed to be really popular to get Aiden catfish. I'm like, they didn't have it when I lived there. All we had was tobacco. You work at the tobacco fields. When I went by the place, it's one of the tobacco fields I used to farm as a kid. They got the catfish farm out there now. Raising catfish. And it was expensive, Jesse said. Well, some of the dietary laws were because you couldn't cook the meat thoroughly enough to, to, to get it to the right temperature to make sure it was, it was uh, cooked and killed all the bacteria. As time went on, they got better about it. Amen. And then the Lord said, okay, you can eat it now. I will eat, listen, I don't even, well, if you don't eat pork, I, that's fine. I'll eat yours, and we'll talk about it in heaven, how good it was and what you missed out on. Amen. Okay. Now, so um, Paul goes on here in the next verse, says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up uh, um, in, in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast obtained, or attained. Here he says, now, I, I really, it was a transition between some of those things. And now if you put remembrance, your brother in remembrance of these things. You know, pastors have to put you in remembrance of stuff. Pastors, do not fall into the trap. You've got to come up with some hot, new, newfangled, cool, slick, I mean, hot as fire. I mean, the latest, greatest that you can sell multiple tape series of every time you step into the pulpit. There's a lot of things you need to be doing to tell people stuff over again. They need to hear faith again. They need to hear that Jesus is the healer, that Jesus is the savior, that Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Ghost, that he's the soon returning, that kind of a four square thing, four square church, you know, the soon returning king, that, you know, you can live by faith and not by sight, that we overcome by the word of our testimony and the blood of the lamb, glory to God. We need to be told these things over and over and over and over again. I'm going to tell you something, just because I had a good state don't mean I'm not going to have another one. As a matter of fact, if I've had a good state, I'm likely to go get another one just because it tasted good. Amen. If I had some good old Eastern Carolina barbecue, I'm likely to go get some more because it tastes good. I think it tastes good. And if you don't, well, we can pray for you too. 
Now, I know some folks from Texas. I love you. They won't even touch our vinegar-based Eastern-style hand-chopped pork barbecue because Texas barbecue is the only barbecue. That old saucy mess dipped all down in that sauce and all that stuff. Beef barbecue. Now, let me, can I say this? I like all kinds, but the best is Eastern Carolina. We can argue about it until Jesus comes back, and I'll be right. The Lord, we will get to heaven. The Lord will say, Ed was right. Hallelujah. Ed's got a barbecue stand. Go on over there and get, get your taste buds fixed. I'm teasing now. All right. If you'll put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister. We want to be good ministers. Pastors, ministers, we want to be good ministers, amen, of Jesus Christ. What? Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. We need to be, church, we need to be preaching good doctrine. Not edgy doctrine. Not right on the edge and hope we get by with it somehow doctrine. We need to be preaching good doctrine. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. This is what he says still. But refuse profane and old wives' fables. <laughs> now, I'm not going to get too bad on the women. But we don't need to listen to, you know. I, I've, I've heard uh, my, my grandma used to say stuff, and I think, you know, I, I knew better. The word knew better. But, you know, here, here, now listen. Fables and say it. Stories that they make up. Are they told and passed down from generation to generation? Or statements, the Lord helps those who help themselves. That's like an old wives' fable. Because it ain't in the Bible. Now, I know you thought it was. Some of it, I, I, when I got saved, I know it was. I did say note it. I knew it was in the Bible. Man, I, if you ask me where it was, I said, I don't know, but I'll find it. And I looked. And I looked. And I looked, had a big old Strong's concordance. I mean, when I'm honking, looked up every word in that verse. The Lord helps those who help themselves. Even the word the. And so all Strong's does is give you all the references to the word the in there. He doesn't need to give the verse. You know? And I took me a week. Never found it. And then the next week I looked for cleanliness is next to godliness. Because Grandmama told me that was, I mean, she taught like it was first such and such, such and such. I did find what it was. It was first opinions 2-2. Two, two. What was first opinions 2 1? The Lord helps those who help themselves. Hello? Are you here? You're going home. I mean, you know, we, we get all these things. We don't need to be uh, uh, tied into old wise fables. We don't, we, we're to refuse um, profane and old wise fables. We're to rather exercise ourselves unto godliness. We need to spend more time exercising ourselves unto godliness. Amen? Now, this is this. Here's another misnomer. This is the first opinions. Uh, two, three. For bodily exercise doesn't profit you a bit. Is that what it says? No, it says bodily exercise profiteth little. What's that mean? There is profit in bodily exercise. We know it is. But in comparison, we, now listen, how many, I don't know if you've ever been a workout junkie. I was at one time. When I was, um, when I graduated from high school and I got into college and, and um, um, I started working, I worked out six days a week. An hour and a half, two hours every day. I'd go on my lunch break from Parker's Barbecue and go lift weights and come back and work another six hours. I was like a lifting machine. This, I mean, just all, that's all I did was lift, 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 lift. It got, got big. Got really big, you know, too big. I mean, I just, you know, I got, I was, I'd bench 360 in a pyramid. That's, that means you don't go in there and do it one time. You would go from, I, I warmed up at 185. That's right. That's where I started. Just I do my ten reps just to warm up with 185. I can't even max out there probably right now. Okay, and then work my way up in sets of five to eight, all the way up to 360. That's where I max, and then I'd come back down. Okay, then I then I would squat 400 and deadlift 400. You know, now I squat. I don't mean squat when I mean that was a pyramid up. I could do 400 about ten times squatting. Okay, and. Uh, <laughs> Lordy, six days a week. Now, let me tell you something. If you're working out six days a week, you don't have a whole lot of time for a lot of other stuff. When you, your day gets eat up with the gym. All right? Now, the Bible doesn't say that exercise doesn't profit you. It said it profiteth little. Or in, in, in relationship to godliness, it's, it's not as much profit to you. In other words, keep things in balance. It's fine to exercise, just keep it in balance. Now, I mean, you know people, there are people right now, you know, they're up in the, they'll get up and go to the gym at 5.30 in the morning. They can't make church at 10.30 on Sunday. Now, you know, and I'm talking to you. Yes, I am talking to you. 
You're sitting out there going, he's talking to me. You are right. I am talking to you. If you can get up at 5.30 and get yourself to the gym so you can exercise and get in your routine and you can't make it and get your back in in church by 10.30, your priorities are out of place. I don't like that guy. Well, because I told you the truth. Yeah, you can get down to the gym and flap your jaws and work out and sweat and get a shower and get to work by 8 o'clock, but you can't get to church. I need my rest. Well, rest one of them other days. More important than anything in your life is the Word of God and, getting, and growing in the things of God. Bodily exercise is fine. It's got to find its right place. And that's what he said. It profits little. Okay? But godliness is profitable unto all things. Having the promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. Wow. Paul's saying godliness. You're not going to get to living a life of godliness not ever showing up at church and not ever getting taken... Uh, let me kind of say this, taken to the cleaners. The word, <coughs> the word is profitable. It's profitable for doctrine. It's profitable, pro profitable for correction, for reproof and instruction and in righteousness. What's that mean? Every time you come to church, you're not going to walk out the door going, Woo! That was awesome! I just love to go to my church. I never feel bad when I go to my church. You better go to church and find out some stuff you're not doing right. Don't tell me you got everything right. Don't tell me you're doing it. It doesn't matter. I'm under grace. Jesus go make everything work out right. <coughs> go stick your head in the sink for 10 seconds and pull it back out. Cold water, please. How, how silly can you be? There is no way in the world you're doing everything you need to be doing, and God's not going to make you do everything right. If he did, the day you got born again, you'd be doing everything right. If he's going to make you, if grace is going to make you, the second you said, Jesus be my Lord, you would have never made another mistake. Now, you've got to grow. Receive with me, that's the ingratitude word, say with the Savior's soul. Uh, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. <clears throat> Amen. I mean, all the principles of God's word is a growth process. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. Everything about the Bible is a growth process. Your spirit gets born again, but it's born again as a babe in the Lord. It needs to grow. Your mind needs to get renewed. Your body needs to be whooped. Thank you for the one sneeze. At least we got a sneeze out of that one. Yeah, you're going to have to keep your body under. So what's that mean? Now, we're not going to come to church every time I tell you you're a bunch of rank, rank dog sinners, but the Word of God should cut through you and pierce through all the junk and say, this in your life needs to be corrected. It is an inhibitor between you walking in the fullness of what God has for you and your ability to do it. You've got to get that thing straightened out, and the Word of God should be doing that in your life. You should walk in, and, you know, you've been taught all your life because you've been around a bunch of crazy people that, you know, it doesn't matter what you do, you can get away with it and still make heaven. God, God is not, listen, if all God was concerned about was you getting to heaven, he'd have saved you and took you. <coughs> We're to grow. We're to grow up in the Him in all things. Amen? Hallelujah. So, Paul, Paul tells Timothy that if he, uh, um, it's a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God and who is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. These things command and teach. Paul's told, to, he's, he's, he is to command and teach these things. We are to live for God. We're supposed to be living godly. Everybody say godly. Not, not superfluous. Not in the flesh. We're to be living godly. There's to be a godliness about us. I know some folks don't like that. But it's still the truth. Did you know there's a poll out now? Pew poll just came out. America is at, I believe, the lowest point of believing in God. Now, wait a second. Now, we've had about 20 years of seeker sensitive. The, all the churches whose mantra is to make it easy, to make it relevant, to make it this, to make it that. Nothing that confronts anybody. And what has happened in that 20 years? The belief, the belief in God and our nation has gone down. Not up, gone down. Why? Because when they come to our churches, they're not confronted with anything that would make them believe that, that, that they need to be different than what they are. 
As a matter of fact, they're told they can stay the same. Come join our, you know, life gardening group. And they will find ways to hook them into the church or actually to the Sunday morning social club. And they find ways to get everybody interested in doing something so they'll show up and they give them a nice psychologically, you know, inspiring message of, you know, well-being. And there's not radical change in their life. I never forget, forget the word radical. That's not a Bible term. There's not transformance in their life. They're not transformed. Why? Because there's nothing to challenge them that what you are and, what, and how you came is anti-God and not what God. God wants to transform you. He doesn't want to leave you like you are. Jesus did not come to leave us as we were. He came to change us. He came to transform us. The new birth is called the new birth because there is a new birth. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Not the same old creature with a few, you know, uh, upgrades. He's a new creature. Are you here? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He's a new creature. Everybody say new. We've passed from death unto life. See, before you, before you come to Jesus and before you're born again, you are Satan's your daddy. John 8, 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will fulfill. Come on to our church. You don't have to change this. Join our gardening group. Join our rock climbing group. We even have a rock climbing wall in the back of the church. Miss the service. Go out there and climb the wall and watch it on the television. You know, we'll have it muted so it won't disturb your climbing, but you can at least see the pastor up there. We've had a lot of secret sensitive garbage out there. We've had a bunch, and the belief in God is going down, not up. Because we're compromising the message. Jesus did not go and say, go into all the world and tell them they're cool. He said, go into all the world and tell them to repent. Preach the gospel to every creature, and he told them to repent. What was, well, he didn't say that. Did you read Peter's first sermon? Repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That just means to change your mind. Oh, my gosh. Stop being a, a lazy Bible student. Go do some deeper study. There's more. To, the, the repentance of changing the mind is corresponding with actions because of what took place in your life. Not just simply, I changed my mind. It's, the new birth is greater than just a change. Well, because it's a spiritual thing. The mind gets renewed. It's not just changing your mind. That, that's original Greek, you know, classical Greek, but changes with Septuagint and with New Testament usage. The word carries on deeper meanings. You got to read the classical Greek. You know, the word agape had a different meaning in, in classical Greek. The, you know, different words throughout the Bible had different meanings in classical Greek, and then they were used in the Septuagint where they translated the Hebrew, and then you learn a lot about what they were trying to say. They used that Greek word to translate a bunch of Hebrew words that meant things, and then that took on a meaning, and then when it got to the New Testament, Jesus took the word agape and made it a completely different meaning, the way he coined it. Hallelujah. The word of God. We want to be good ministers, pastors, and, and, and ministers, you know, evangelists and teachers and apostles and prophets. We do want to be good ministers, and we want to preach things that transform the lives of believers and not leave them where they are. Telling them, we're so, we are so bent on making sure nobody is unhappy, we compromise the message that is needed to make them happy. You will not be full of joy and happiness until you resolve issues that stand between you and the Father. And even if you get born again, if you're living contrary to his word, that's an issue that stands between you and the Father. Can I get a holy grunt out there, please, somebody? Can somebody stand and say, help me, Lord? Amen. We have got to get back ministers. This is a letter to you ministers. We are to be pre preaching good doctrine. <coughs> Not doctrine that appeases the ears of the hearers. 
We are to speak as the oracles of the Almighty God. We are to proclaim what He declares out of His Word by the unction of the Holy Ghost so that it pierces into the hearts of men and women and brings a transformation in their life. So why? So they can strip off the weights and the sin that do easily beset them and run the patience, with patience the race that is set before them. It is our obligation, pastors. It is our obligation, ministers. It is our obligations, whoever you are, that preaches to other people. It is our obligation to preach good doctrine and give the people what they need to experience a transformation on a daily basis. They might not send money to my ministry. Get out of the ministry. If all you're concerned about is selling your book and your latest uh, 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 series so you can make a lot of money and you can go live uh, in a lascivious lifestyle, you're just prostituting the gospel and get out. If you can't preach the truth, then don't preach. Amen. Wake up. I know I'm speaking by unction of the Holy Ghost to somebody. You're watching me right now, and you've been struggling because you've been trying to compromise the gospel because you want to make money. And yeah, let me tell you something. Don't you, don't you even think I'm preaching because I've got a you know, multi-million dollar house, and I'm living lasciviously and all this kind of stuff. I've taken about a 90% pay cut in the last three years. 90 We're still preaching that I'm not going to compromise the truth if we get a 100% pay cut. We're going to preach the truth. Hello. Going to keep preaching the truth. Because we have to. I, because I can't give you things that won't transform your life and then go stand before the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, and give an account of those things. When what I needed to give you would help you and I didn't and it caused great damage in the body. I can't stand before him and answer for that. We like it at the happy clappy church. I like happy clappy too. Hello, I like, I like, I love, I love it when we're running. I love it when we're shouting. I love it when we're flipping over the chairs and I mean sliding under the chairs and hanging from the, the rafters and I mean we're having us a Holy Ghost Pentecostal time. I love it. I love it when the Spirit of God manifests in that kind of demonstration where the joy of the Lord is just, just breaks loose all over the place. I love it. Been there. Experienced it. Lived in it. Walked in it. Done it. But I've also been in the meetings where the Word of God pierced through you and cut in your heart and, and, and cut out those things that were hindrances to your growing in God and growing in grace. And it was not pleasurable. It was not fun. And it's even worse when your wife takes her beanie little elbow and rips you in the side with it and says, what you going to do with that one? Because she knows he's preaching right at me. Is that a camp meeting when your brother Hagin was preaching right at me? I'm not, I don't know if anybody else got anything out of that message, but he had him preach it for me. That Hagin preached a love sermon to me. I was not walking in love with somebody. And my wife could Wham! What you going to do with that? I'm thinking, if you hit me one more time, what you going to do? I'm going to take it and shut up. I know, I know who's the boss. Hallelujah. Yeah! I didn't enjoy that sermon. I did, to this day, I didn't enjoy that sermon. It was not pleasurable to sit out there and get rebuked from the beginning of the time he opened his mouth to the time he finally said, let's close the Bibles. That was not pleasurable. There's no pleasure getting rebuked by the word of God. Are you here? But there's profit. I said there's profit. Y'all hear? I said there's profit. Not Holy Ghost prophet, prophesying prophet. There is profitability. There's gain. When, when the word of God comes and corrects you and straightens you out and you get things out of your life. I did. I did. I did. I got it out. I dealt with it. That day, I didn't deal with it in that service. I had to go back and sulk a little bit. It ain't fair, Lord. They did such and such to me. He wouldn't even talk to me. He wouldn't talk to me, Melanie. You know why? Because he done told me what he thought about it. He had Brother Hagin preach an hour and a half sermon on it. He'd already said what he had to say about the matter. Won't well, nothing I could do to change his mind. Well, because his word was already established in that arena. So I had to deal with it. Amen. 
Because these things command the things. That's where I got off in all this. We are responsible. Ministers, we are responsible to the people we minister to. To give them good doctrine. To teach them the things that are good for them. Amen. Let, and then Paul tells Timothy in a personal exhortation, let no man despise thy youth. But be an example of the believers. How? In word. In conversation. That's old King James for lifestyle. In charity, the Greek word agape, so love. In spirit, in faith, in purity. I'm telling you, you pastors better stop doing your drugs. And you better stop drinking and smoking and running around with women acting just like the world and living ungodly. You better clean your house up. I know we got some people here, but I am talking. I know there are people watching me on the internet, and I am telling you, get your act together and get your house cleaned up. Straighten yourself out. Well, there's nothing wrong with drinking. I'm telling you, if all you can think of that some way to get away with drinking, there's something wrong with your walk with the Lord. Smoking stogies, drinking your different types of mixed drinks, having your sex uh, dancing parties, living like the world. And they would have run around and preached Jesus. You're disqualifying yourself by lacking your purity in your life. Now God will let you get away. With, just because you've gotten away with it don't mean you're going to keep getting away with it. There are going to be some ministers wake up dead in bed. And everybody's going to say, I don't know what happened. The Lord took him home. No. Nobody knows about it, but they've been living a secret, impure life. Straighten up. I said, straighten up. Get your act together. I'm, I'm, we look at the American church and all they can think about is how they can get away with stuff and we see the belief in God going down. Don't, don't fool yourself that if you go into the bar and you pull up and get yourself a, some scotch or you get some rum and you smoke a stogie up there that, you're, that people will think you're a cool pastor and show up in your church and have a life transforming experience with Jesus Hello? You might get one or two like that, but I'm going to tell you what, what, how you win them is how you got to keep them. And you win them by acting in the flesh, you're going to have to keep them by acting in the flesh, and eventually God's going to demand pay up to get your life straight. Y'all got as quiet as the first church of the frozen chosen out there. Come on, now, I need some support here. Amen? So, how is he to be an example? In word, in lifestyle, in his love walk, in, his, in the spirit, in faith, and in purity. Keep your life pure. Stay out of the bed of your neighbor's wife. I just couldn't help myself. Oh, yes, you can. You offer your body a living sacrifice which is wholly acceptable unto God in your spiritual service. Come on now. But you just don't know. I couldn't. Yes, oh. Listen, Flip Wilson, Geraldine. The devil made me do it, honey. The devil can't make you do nothing you don't want to do. Moving right along. Verse 13. Till I come, Paul says, till I get to give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. In other words, make sure you're putting the right things first. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on the hands of the presbytery. In other words, they lay hands on him, and he was equipped for things for the ministry. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy prophecy may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing so thou shalt save thyself and them that hear thee. Notice he's telling him in this last statement, this verse, take heed to the doctrine and to thyself. Why? Because you're going to help save people. We have, it's a, it's a minister's letter. Now, the people that read it get to get some stuff on it, but I'm telling you, it's a minister's letter. It's a, to ministers. Take heed to the doctrine you teach. Take heed to how you live. Why? Because you save yourself and those that hear you. You start giving them uh, leftover garbage, refuse, dog vomit, and they ain't going to get saved. What do you mean dog vomit? I mean stuff that ain't Bible. I mean stuff that you dream up that's going to get attendance and big money, but ain't going to change your life. 
I like going to that church, man. Why? They smoke dope. They smoke cigars. They drink bum. They drink bourbon. They all, I mean, they, they, I know those pastors are drinking every night before they go to bed because it helps them relax. When was the last time you just laid in bed and prayed in the Holy Ghost? My God. Need some bourbon? How about pray in tongues? Get full of the Holy Ghost. Somebody say amen. Somebody else say, Sunday, hallelujah. Amen. I said, amen. All right. That's it for uh, second, ten, first Timothy chapter 4, 5 next week. Hallelujah. How many love Jesus? We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or Using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.